Great. Okay, welcome everyone to the second installment of the um, online <coughs> long term conference uh, on geometric lung lens. It's a great pleasure today to have uh, Nick Rosenblum. Uh, I hope I'm reading your name right. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. Yeah, uh, who's going to speak about spectral decomposition in geometric lung lens. Okay, over to you. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak here. And this is all. Um, in some sense, a continuation of Sam's talk from last week. It's the same, about the same work. I uh, joined with Arinkin, Gates, Gori, Pashdan, Raskin, and Warshavsky. Um, so um, let me kind of set the stage a little bit. So, so last week, uh, Sam tried to give some motivation and state the, um, well, this restricted version of the geometric, of the geometric line lens conjecture. Uh, version of geometric lung lens conjecture, which says that, um, you know, sheaves with nilpotent singular support on the moduli space of G bundles um, on a curve is equivalent to, well, something called INCO, so also unfortunately NILP uh, on this, uh, restricted local systems um, on the moduli space of uh, G check local systems with restricted variation. So I, the last time this word restricted was explained and um, I will um, return to that in a little bit. Uh, maybe, maybe right away, uh, Sam already said this, but let me emphasize again on both sides, it's tempting to see NILP on both sides and think that they have something to do with each other. As far as we know, those are completely unrelated, in, uh, despite that they're denoted as a subscript nil on both sides. They play a completely, they seem to play a completely different role uh, in, in, in this whole story. Um, so, you know, this is, this is restricted also in the sense that there's a kind of a larger conjecture that makes sense over fields of characteristic zero. Uh, in fact, there are two larger conjectures uh, that make sense over fields of characteristic zero in the context of erratic sheaves uh, in, uh, over finite fields. Uh, this seems to be as good as one can hope for of a, of a conjecture. So the, um, of course, uh, any kind of Langlands conjecture is not just a conjecture of the form that A is equal to B. It's not the assertion that these two categories are abstractly isomorphic, but they come with some additional structure and this isomorphism. And most of the interesting content is that not only is this isomorphic, but this isomorphism respects certain structure. And also that structure allows one to, uh, gives hope to actually build this isomorphism. So the, so the additional structure which has to do with the title of this talk, which is spectral decomposition structure uh, is a heta action. So let me remind you. So I'll do, I'll do this on, on, on both sides. So there's the heca stack. Heca G, we just call it heca. Uh, it's a correspondence between bungee and bungee times the curve. So this is the set of triples. So a point on the curve and two G bundles together with an isomorphism away from this point. One, G2. Um, so the point is that the um, geometric Satake isomorphism Uh, gives, oh, I should say, I shouldn't say, it is, gives, uh, gives a functor, well, it's really a monoidal functor uh, from the category of representations of G check uh, into well, sheaves uh, on this Hecke stack. Uh, and so convolution uh, gives an action So we have this action of rep G check, uh, tensor sheaves on G 
uh, and the target is sheaves on Bungie uh, times x. Well, it doesn't it doesn't exactly look like an action, but you should. Uh, but the way to think about it is that for every point of x, there's an action of the category of um, representations of G-check on this category of sheaves on Bungie. So, so, so far there's no nilpotent support in the picture. Um, and um, so originally as formulated, um, um, I guess by Lamon, uh, what one expects, so, so expects, Lamon, is that for every, well, at least irreducible, oh, oh, let me call this H, reducible, reducible local system, sigma, um, a Hecke eigensheath. Is a sheaf on Bungie. Oops. Sheaf on Bungie. Uh, so, Hecke, uh, never mind you, Hecke eigen sheaf means that when you apply this Hecke operator, so H of V, comma F, this is supposed to be isomorphic to, uh, well, it's a sheaf on Bungie times X. So, you, you take your original sheaf. You take its box product to V sub sigma, where V sub sigma is the is the is the sheaf associated, is the associated sheaf to the representation. Given a given a given given a um, given a local system, a G check local system, and a representation of G check, you get a well, a uh, local system like a GLV local system. Uh, so. The um, so th so that's uh, that's that's kind of one version of um, spectral decomposition. And so there's you know if we're working over a finite field, there's an action of Frobenius on everything. And so the idea is that the way this is set up is that you know there's a function sheaf correspondence. Uh, so if you have one of these Hecke eigen sheaves and you take the trace of Frobenius that gives a function um, on Bungie, and the uh, the way this is all set up. Is so that is precisely so that the corresponding function would be an eigenfunction with the eigenvalue, with this eigenvalue uh, for the um, action of the algebra, the Hecke algebra on automorphic forms. Um, uh, so, uh, so already one, fr from this, one can sort of see uh, the MOV for this nilpa G, which is that Lamont conjectured that Hecke eigensheaves uh, have nilpotent singular support. So that's uh, actually one of the motivations for why one is um, um, one, one, one looks at this particular subcategory of all sheaves. Uh, and, you know, in fact, this conjecture is a consequence uh, of, this, um, of this work that I will, we're describing. Um, so, okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's one thing. Uh, so, so more generally, uh, so a little bit more generally is you can do this, you can look at this Hecke stack over here, and you can observe, well, there was a point in X that we fixed, uh, or there was a point in X that, that was allowed to vary. So it was something parameterized by a point in X, but this kind of thing makes sense, uh, not only for a point, but for any finite subset of X. So for a finite, whoops, for a finite set, set I, we have, Uh, well, let me just write the upshot. Uh, we have Hecke functors. H sub i from G check tensor i. She used on the G. Two. G 
values on, on G tensor X to the I. Uh, so this is the, so this is in this, um, in this geometric story, well, categorical Shifi story, this is what play, these, these functors, this kind of action is what plays the role of the Hecke algebra. And so the, um, as we'll see, it's gonna be very important that to allow kind of different I, not just one. Uh, that's gonna, uh, in, in the setting, we're gonna be able to get a lot of mileage out of that. Um, so well, so this is this is the this is the kind of Hecke action, and uh, on the um, on the automorphic side. Um, so I should say that on the spectral side, the spectral side, uh, we have the following thing. So let me. So now um, I have to remind you what uh, this Luxus restricted is. So recall. That looks yes, restricted of x. So as a functor of points, so s is an affine scheme. And this as well, by definition, is uh, well, right t exact. I should say. Uh, I guess it goes without saying that everything is derived. So sorry, and that's. Uh, Probably should have said that in the beginning. So, in particular, this Luxus restricted is an object of derived algebraic geometry. Uh, tensor functors from rep D check. This is D check. Uh, representations of D check to, uh, well, this thing that I think in some talk was uh, called Lease, but let me call it. Q lease of uh, X tensor quasi co of S. There's a groupoid of such. So this is a kind of purely Tanakhian description. Um, and so, so from this, so have um, sort of tautologically, if you apply, well, this this is all, this is also true not just for S and affine scheme. But for 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 any for any stack as well, uh, uh, so 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 what we have is just just purely formally we have a tensor functor, which is also right t exact, uh, yeah, uh, from wrap check to this x tensor. As you call, Luxus restricted. Let you check. Uh, and this is this is this is what's supposed to give a this is what's supposed to give an action. And so, and more generally, and for each i, this maps to well. I can just take the i power of this. Whoops. Uh, I guess I should. Um, I guess I should have mentioned that in all the settings we're considering, this this category of least sheaves has the property that least sheaves on a power of X is the tensor product of the categories. So technical issue that's not quite obvious in this setting, but it's true. Uh, tensor. What's it called? Tensor I, and so we can compose this with uh, sorry about that. Um, so so we can compose this with a kind of tensor multiplication function. So so may I ask a question? It's a yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, but it's a little bit uh, about the previous thing. But I just yeah. To, so if it, I'm just trying to understand this uh, eigen uh, sheaves and especially what the eigen value would be. 
So HVF is F uh, entered with V sigma. V sigma. So, so the so sigma is the eigenvalue. But sigma was okay. So you start off with a chosen eigenvalue. Yes, and an eigen sheaf for this eigenvalue is. Okay, so the result is that it exists, and uh, with this particular. Well, no. Well, no, I said that's the expectation. I see. Okay, no, but that's. Uh, but I mean, this is a content of one version of the geometric Langlands conjecture. Uh, for function fields. So, so for GLN, this is true, for instance, uh, which is uh, Frank Gates, Gary Valonen. Um, uh, in general, in general, that's in general, that's still a conjecture. I see. Uh, can you just elaborate a little bit on what V sigma is? So sigma is the um, is the local system that you so start off. So sigma is a G check local system. Importantly. Uh, so sigma is a G-check local system, and V is a representation of G-check. So anytime you have such a thing, you can form, it's like this. So, so you can think, I mean, the picture you probably should have in mind is that a G-check local system is something like a principal bundle yep. uh, with a principal G-check bundle. Yep. And then if you have a principal bundle for a group and you have a representation of the group, you can take the associated vector bundle. This mm -hmm. is what V sigma is. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, so it's a, okay, got it. It's, I would say it's a sheaf twisted by sigma on. Uh, yes, sure. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, Nick, could I ask a question as well? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> I, should have, I should have asked last week, but but I forgot. And then, uh, yeah. So, um, so in this definition of locks is restricted uh, G check. Oh, uh, yeah, here's the definition. Right. So uh, I understood this as a family of G-check local system on X parametrized by S essentially. That's right. Now, but what is the restricted? Why is this restricted? Yeah, so this is restricted because it's, um, it's because of what you mean. It's the, the, the thing that's restricted is that the amount that the G-check local system is allowed to vary. Right. So it's so the, the full is uh, with restricted variation. So let me try to uh, let me try to explain. It has to do with this category here. Uh, okay. So roughly, this category uh, is not quite, but roughly, you take uh, you take least sheaves. So in other words, um, um, sheaves which are um, cohomologically bounded and yeah. have, uh, and all the cohomologies are local systems. In other words, they're finite dimensional. So these have total finite, dim uh, finite dimensional total cohomology and you know, each um, cohomology sheaf is a local system. Right. And so, uh, and, and then you take end of that because we want to be working in the world of kind of in, uh, well, otherwise if, uh, if S is an infinite dimensional algebra, you're not gonna get anywhere. Right. Uh, The point is, in doing this, you're still, you're still not able to pass uh, kind of continuously in this moduli space from one semi-simple local system to another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because precisely because um, so, I mean, so the the the, the, the ex so in in a lattic world, there's there's kind of doesn't seem to be anything better. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we were working over C, or over, um, there are kind of two enhancements, two improvements on this. This mm -hmm. is a substack of both. Uh, one is the Betty version and one is the Durham version. Right. Um, so uh, in a minute, maybe it's um, easiest to compare with the Betty version. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there you would take just uh, this, it, it would be the same definition except this category would be replaced by the full subcategory of the unbounded derived category of sheaves with the condition that all cohomology sheaves are locally constant. Right. Right. Um, and so mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the difference in, so technically it's the difference in finiteness conditions, but practically um, this means that any family, um, any family, so, so it, it has the following consequence that any family parameterized by S, mm -hmm. uh, the semi-simplification of the local system will be constant. Uh-huh, is that right, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this whole moduli space, um, you know, so like for instance in the Betty, it's just well at the classical level, it's just representations of pi one. Well, that's a that's a nice connected stack. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, here, it's, it's, it's disconnected and the connected components are exactly parameterized by, uh, by the semi-simple local systems. I see. No, I think I understand, right? So the only real families are these are, um, uh, extensions, even in- this, Yes. Right. Uh, um, I mean, extensions and kind of formal. Right. Uh, formal, I see, informal completions in some sense. Exactly. Right, yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, a, a piece of this, I mean, I think something that's familiar in number theory is looking at these formal deformation rings. That's right, yeah. uh, So each point here is bigger than the, than the formal deformation ring. So right. it's bigger kind of in two directions. One, it includes all automorphisms, not just formal automorphisms as a stack. Right. Uh, and also it kind of includes extensions. That's right, yeah, no, I see, I understand. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, so these formal deformation rings in number theory also can't be patched together. Actually. Right. Yeah, just formal, <laughs> you can take yeah. unions of them, but not much more. Right. right, yeah. I mean, this is kind of a little bit bigger than that. Just a little bit bigger. Right. The, well, this is an, a bit of an improvement yeah. on that, yeah, I, see. I would yeah. say. Thanks very much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, so, so I was just, so I was in the middle of so so on the on morphic side we have these kind of Hecke functors, uh, and I was trying to describe what they're supposed to look like on the spectral side. So on the spectral side we also have this. So this this Culis sits inside sheaves. So, uh, so the uh, and well so so these are supposed so whoops so. So these functors are supposed to match up with these ones. This is how this uh, correspondence is supposed to work. Um, but what you, um, uh, well, what do you mean by this? Sorry, what do I mean by this one? This lands in quasi-co here. And so quasi-co. And quasi-co. Luxus restricted. So this is all. You check acts on uh, this int co omnipotent singular support. There's a kind of a natural action. So, so, so the upshot. So let me. Um, so the upshot is, is, is this, that the, that the Hecke action is that one expects, let me say it like this, one expects the Hecke action uh, on the automorphic category, on the automorphic category to factor through Um, also, this quasi coherent sheaves on restricted local systems. So, this is the. And indeed, um, and indeed, in this context, this, and indeed, the spectral decomposition theorem is the, is the assertion that this happens. So, there's a. Uh, uh, so. Uh, Oh, so let's see, maybe, yeah, let me state the theorem and then I'll, I'll explain a few things about it. So the theorem is that there's an action quasi co access scripted to check on the sheaves with no button support on G and kind of as expected. Um, so, um, uh, so, well, so let me, let me say what this means in terms of this kind of spectral decomposition, more naive spectral decomposition in terms of um, Hecke eigenschiefs and whatnot. Um, so what happens is, so, so, so recall is that this, this whole stack looks uh, restricted, lo of restricted local systems. This is a disjoint union uh, parameterized by semi-simple. Simple, jack local system. Uh, 
of you know the corresponding components. Sub sigma, uh, and so, and therefore, uh, well, so therefore, quite well, quasi coherent sheaves on a disjoint union is just a product. Uh, it's just a product of categories, and so well, if you have a product of categories acting on another category, uh, then that gives it. Uh, then the category splits up. So the upshot of this is that this sheaves of milk. By G, uh, this is uh, the splits as a direct sum, also parameterized by, um, by these local systems. Uh, G. So this gives a kind of a very strong. Um, very strong kind of orthogonal decomposition of this category parameterized by the semi-simplification. I mean, in particular, as I mentioned, uh, I don't know if I'll get to say much about this in this talk, but um, one upshot of this work is, is, a, is a proof of Lamont's conjecture that all Hecke eigenschiefs have no potent singular support. Uh, and one consequence of what this means right away is that if you take two Hecke eigenschiefs with different, with different eigenvalues, uh, then there are kind of no X between them. They, they, they completely don't talk to each other. No, sorry, Nick. Uh, one uh, simple question again, I think. Um, yeah. So, so this action in the theorem is the one is you're extending the action of individual G check local system via okay, correspondences, right? Yeah. This convolution action. But, yes, exactly. Right, but what you wrote above when you said quasi co uh, lock is restrict and uh, I think it's obscured now, just one line above the upshot, I think. Oh, yeah. This action yeah, so and int co nilpotent, is this supposed to be obvious? Oh, I, well, I didn't say what int co nil, yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, int co is kind of a version of quasi co. Oh, and I the way quasi co acts on quasi co is just by tensoring. Right, that's right. Yeah. And so, in the in the same way, uh, in the same way, quasico acts on intco. So it, uh, it, it it preserves this intco nilpotent. That is. Yeah, it does. I right. mean, it preserves. I, I mean, that's just a general feature that if right. you take intco anything, oh, uh, then quasico acts with, on this. I see. I see. No, I think I understand. Uh, so so quasi so so quasico is you know like intco with zero singular support. I see. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but I think, uh, yeah, I think it makes sense. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so uh, but yeah, a, I mean, yeah, this is a so, very so, naive action. <laughs> yeah, no, this 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 action is extremely naive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the point is, you know, if you believe if you believe in this conjecture, it tells you it tells you something kind of interesting that these uh, that these kind of very geometric things on the automorphic side, which yeah. are which are the Hecke, which the Hecke action uh, are supposed to factor factor through an act here. Right. Um, fa factor through this kind of uh, the category of quasi coherent sheaves on, uh, mm. on this moduli stack. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So, let me make a. Uh, so, 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 let me explain a little bit what's involved uh, in the proof of this theorem. Uh, and then I want to, well, anyway, so that's the kind of the first, it's meant to be the first half of. This talk is to explain a little bit of how this how this theorem is proven, uh, but first, uh, you know, really the motivation for how um, how this works comes from uh, comes from topology. So let me make a little bit of a digression about what happens in the case of uh, Betty geometric ornaments. Digression is the Betty setting. Uh, so here. Uh, X is an algebraic curve over the complex numbers. So here, it's not enough to, uh, you know, we're going to be working with the analytic topology, so it's not even enough to be over a field of characteristic zero. We're really over the complex numbers. So we have, uh, you know, these. We can define this Betty moduli stack of Betty local systems on X. Uh, so this is uh, 
Right. Stack. Of. Ready local systems. Uh, so, well, one way of describing it, let me try to, let me try to give a Tanakian description of it. I already mentioned this. So this, this also has a Tanakian description, which looks very similar. So that should be encouraging. Let T exact tensor functors from check into Uh, of. So you take the complex points of X, you look at all sheaves, so the unbounded derived category of sheaves, that's what this AN superscript is supposed to mean uh, for analytic. Uh, and LC stands for locally constant, so it's with the condition that every, um, every cohomology sheaf is, uh, is, a, is locally constant. Uh, and importantly, I'm imposing absolutely no finiteness conditions. You want to, ex oh, sorry. Uh, so this is, a, so this, this, is, this is one way of defining it. So this is a kind of a Tanakhian description. It has all sorts of other descriptions. I mean, so, um, so this is something familiar, uh, maybe, uh, which is that it's kind of, it's R points. So if R is an ordinary ring, not a, so this is a, this is a derived stack. And so it knows more about the topology of, of X than just, Pi one, well, if X is genus bigger than zero, no, because there's nothing else. But uh, in general, this kind of, oh, I put, yeah. Um, in general, this kind of thing is sensitive to higher homotopy groups um, as well. Uh, but, uh, well, the, the derived structure depends on that. But the classical points, so for an, or if you, if you, the functor of points corresponding to an ordinary ring um, is just representations of Pi one of X into, um, into um, G check of R. Oh, uh, that's what this is roughly. Parameterizes representations of pi one of X of C into G check of, of S. This is uh, a reasonable way of thinking about it. So this is the, um, this is this um, kind of Betty modular space. So there's nothing, of course, in order to say this, there was, we didn't use the, any kind of algebraic structure on X, uh, uh, but uh, in order to have any kind of Langlands conjecture, uh, we do need to use the algebraic structure because we need to talk about principal G bundles and that uh, has to be algebraic, uh, but maybe let me not go into that direction. So the, the a, a useful motivation here, what we have, so this is essentially due to Benzvi, Francis and Nadler, is that uh, quasi-coherent sheaves on, on this Betty local systems is the factorization homology over X of C. I'll say what this means in this setting. Um, of um, the category rep G check. Uh, so rep G check is a symmetric monoidal category for such a thing. It makes sense to talk about um, factorization homology for, uh, and you can kind of, that's often denoted by integral and X of C is a, well, thought of as a two-dimensional manifold. You know, there, there are all sorts of ways of thinking about this kind of thing. The important thing is, is that this is a, this is a way uh, of constructing purely category theoretically without any kind of geometry uh, out of representations of G-check, this category of quasi-coherent sheaves on the moduli stack of local systems. Uh, so it gives a kind of a presentation of it, if you will. So, well, let me say what this factorization homology means in the setting. 
So, oh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I should, since this is, since this has this, there's QFT in the title, you can think of this as the value of a quantum field theory evaluated on the surface, um, where the value on the point is a uh, rep check. Um, but so as a symmetric monoidal category, Uh, this integral x of c trap has a universal property. So namely, um, symmetric monoidal functors out of it to somewhere to, uh, I don't know, a, so this is some symmetric monoidal category. Maybe I should say DG category to emphasize uh, that everything is derived uh, is the same as symmetric monoidal functors as well. It's an X of C family of of uh, symmetric monoidal functors. from rep to check into A. So it's, uh, so that's a little bit of inexplicit. Let me, let me reformulate this. So this is the same as a, as a single symmetric monoidal functor. So, well, one way of saying it is that there's a, there's a category of symmetric monoidal functors from rep to check to A. Uh, this is not, this is no longer a DG category no, because it's not linear. But it makes sense to consider functors from X of C into such a thing. Uh, in terms of in terms of kind of purely linear description, uh, this is symmetric monoidal functors uh, if you check to a tensor. She is locally constant. What if X of C? So this is where. This is one place where this appears. Uh, sorry, was there a question? I can yes, please. Uh, it's a, again just because uh, I'm a little bit uh, lost, and I just want to make sure. Uh, okay. So in the beginning, so I mean, just above the page, you have uh, these uh, the space parameterizing uh, pi one well representations of pi one x into g check s. Um, this s is the same affine scheme that you started off with. That's for, right. Yeah, these are the s answer. points. These are S points. So can you give an so example S. of what this G check S is? Because, uh, well, so- um, For some I mean, group and some S, because, uh, well, it's it's at least a group, right? So these are group it, it is a group, yeah. So, so the left-hand side is a group yeah. and the right-hand side is a group. I mean, you know, if you take K, yeah, uh, if you take S to be the ground field you're working in, uh -huh. it's just, you know, G check, say is GLN. This is just usual GLN of K. So the K points are just represent and dimensional representations of the okay. fundamental group. Um, I mean, in general, the way you can kind of try to see this is um, one, one way to approach this space is kind of via generators and relations. So suppose you have some generators and relations for pi one, mm -hmm. um, which you do yeah, yeah, that's canonically right. in the case of a surface group, mm -hmm. uh, then you can express it as a kind of a, then you can express this guy uh, well, up to these issues of higher homotopy groups as some power, as a power of the affine scheme G-check given by the number of uh, generators. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can take the fiber product uh, mm -hmm. with a corresponding number of copies of G-check according to the relations. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you quotient by the adjoint action. And then you will get the stacks. Okay. Uh, at least in the case, uh, at least in the case that uh, uh, you know your space. Your your space is a K pi one. I see, and uh, just uh, uh, I just wanted to clarify. So what is uh, so you mentioned uh, there's something really nice about TQFT. These are uh, three dimensional TQFTs, or where is the? TQFT? Oh well, well I well I well I didn't say what the dimension was. I mean, uh, the uh, maybe I should say these are kind of not fully extended. So these are kind of two-dimensional TQFTs where the value on a two-manifold is a category. 
Uh, I mean, you can, you can, you can, you can do more than that, but. Uh, I see. So it's a TQFT living on a two-dimensional surface of genus G, G being the genus. Yeah, of the that's right. Values and, in category. Okay. Yeah, where the values are in a category. The, the thing that you assign to a point is a, well, in this case, symmetric monoidal category, really you need. Uh, so I guess it's, you can think of it as this kind of thing, that if you, if you have a braided monoidal category, then you can get a two-dimensional topological quantum field theory out of it, of this mm -hmm. form. And mm -hmm. if you kind of forget all the, if you forget most of the multiplicative structure mm -hmm. and regard rep G check as a braided monoidal category, then the course, then this is the evaluating on the corresponding field theory. The fact that it was a symmetric monoidal category rather than just a braided one uh, means that in particular, there's a kind of a tensor structure on, on the result. Okay, cool. I mean, I'd like to understand if you can also make sense of partition functions uh, and uh, path integrals in this uh, setting, but maybe we can do it after the, the talk uh, in the discussion session. Yeah, I mean, this is a bit um, a ways from that because you're getting like, you're at the kind of at the wrong level. Uh -huh. uh, okay. But this isn't, uh, I mean, you know, getting a category as a, as a value of your partition function is not quite what you expect. Not in standard QFTs, that's true. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, this is, I mean, I feel like this is the partition, I mean, the, the way that this works is this is the kind of, what, what is a version of the partition function is this category for the surface. I mean, you can, you can, you can say something more, but let me not go into that. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Nick, I have a quick question. I see yes. this right T exact in the definition, and I'm wondering whether the non-semi-simplicity of representations of uh, G-check actually appears in this, uh, or the possible non-semi-simplicity of the category sorry. of representations. No, no, sorry, we're in characteristic zero. So why, what, what is this? Uh, what, what is, is the, what, what is, is the, what does right what? T exact mean? Why, why, why is that? Oh, well, why is no. that there in characteristic oh. zero? So yeah, so 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 first of all, so first of all, like even when we're working with cur curves over finite fields, this is this is a uh, this is over kill bar. This is so Luxus lives the the ground field for Luxus is the ground field for coefficients, not for the space. So right, is, right, right, right. Yes, of course. Yeah. So, um, but but does so, the no? So it's because I'm because because this category because well, uh, so I guess. I have to apologize. I mean, these symbols mean the derived categories of probably of what you have in mind. I understand that, but still, um, I mean, this and is, so, this, these are representations of G check. It's, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's a semi simple category, absolutely. But I'm taking okay. the derived, it's derived category. And right, sorry, right T exact means the following it means that you have, you know, connective objects go to connective objects. Uh, so right. here's an example. So here's an example of where this kind of th here's an example of the kind of thing you're trying to avoid. Right. Let me let me let me just give you a, a beautiful example of what one doesn't want in this to include in this mm -hmm. definition. It doesn't quite provide any kind of counterexample. I think it's a full example to keep in mind for these kinds of questions. Is you take G to be GM. Mm -hmm. So so rep GM is just graded vector spaces. The simplest the simplest thing mm -hmm. uh, you can imagine. And so th there's a tensor functor from it to itself, uh, which is this kind of shearing where you, um, where you take some, where you take, where you, where you shift, where you take something in weight I and you shift it by cohomological degree two I. Mm, yeah. So that's a perfectly good symmetric monoidal functor, but it's not right T exact. Okay, okay. No, I was just hoping that you might have something to say about the uh, representations with coefficients in uh, no no <laughs> sorry right. no i mean a, a lot of this is pretty specific to to care to the fact that this is characteristic zero i don't know i mean it's it's well it's 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 this kind of thing that fails very badly uh when if g is not characteristic zero if the if g is not over characteristic zero uh yeah yeah, so anyway, I don't know. It would be nice to know if there's a reasonable substitute for, for, for this kind of statement. But for, for, for mod P language, for example. Yeah, for instance, I mean, you, I mean, you can ask even for a comparable statement in topology uh, that, that makes sense as well. 
And as stated, this would be false. That's not, not in characteristic zero. And you can kind of imagine tweaking uh, left-hand side or right-hand side or both a little bit, and, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know of a way to do this to, to get it to work out. Um, yeah, any other questions? All right. So the so so anyway, so this uh, this kind of factorization homology thing has a um, has a universal property, and now it's a purely categorical thing. So we can apply. So 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 we can try to use methods of. Um, Categorical algebra to say something about it. So, so, so a consequence of this. Uh, it's not very hard, but well, let me uh, give a reference. So, this is in this four author paper. So, GKRV is a subset of the uh, people. Is that? Um, let me say two things. One is that uh, is that uh, the data of an uh, 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 is that the data of an action, action, actions of quasi coherent sheaves, local systems, Jack Petty, on some module category M, these are the same as um, a compatible system. Monoidal functors. Of, I don't know. Let me say actions uh, rep u check tensor i mapping to endomorphisms. So acting on M, but tensored with this uh, analytic sheaves. C. To the i, uh, so so this is meant to be functorial in i. And here is a finite set. Uh, so that's that's kind of one thing is that this um, so this should be very encouraging from the point of view is that this looks a lot like what um, this looks a lot like what Hecke functors give you. This is the reason uh, that one should really be encouraged by this uh, by such a description. Uh, and the second thing. Uh, which will be which will be useful is that this whole category, as a category, an object. Maybe I should just say objects. Sorry, when you say consequence, this means a consequence of this factorization homology statement. Or? That's right. I see. Uh, so that I mean, there's nothing. So I'm formulating this in terms of local systems and rep check, but. This this kind of statement, there's really nothing specific to that. I'm a, I'm a little hesitant to try to introduce the terminal the, the general terminology. So to right. specializing okay. to this case. Uh, I see. So so, mm. so uh -huh. this consequence one seems to be uh, what. Uh, um, it's very so close is, to having a spectral action. Right. This is your theorem, so roughly almost. Well, well, not quite. I mean, so far, this is, you know, uh, this is for this Betty module. I oh, that's so. the Betty. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, well, and also it's not quite, there's this local constancy. So, uh, well, okay. let me, let, 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 let me finish the statement for a minute and then I'll, sure. and then I'll compare this with what we have. Uh, it, it is indeed very close. And so that should be encouraging, but it's not quite, uh, it's not, it's not quite there. So, so objects of this category, uh, they also have a, an explicit description. So this is compatible system of functors. Functors, uh, up each stack to the i, to the i, to the sheaves, constant, analytic. Uh, so that's what uh, that's what an object here is. Uh, so okay, so this is a, so this is just a statement about 
how factorization homology of commutative um, of, of symmetric monoidal categories works. That's the, the so it's a so it's a pretty formal statement. Uh, it's, it really is a consequence of uh, this kind of this kind of universal property. Okay, so now uh, uh, I'll say in a few minutes why I wanted the second statement. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, when you say compatible, this is compatible over over the finite set over i. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so it's a you know it's a map in the diagram category uh, from uh, right. of functors from finite sets to categories if you like. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so so these functors have no additional structure other than being functors and and natural in uh, in the finite set. Um, so so the point is that so well let's. Let's look at this. Uh, let's look at this description here, and compare that with what we had uh, for for Hecke functors in the beginning. So if I go back, uh, I have the, here. So I have these Hecke functors. So that looks really good, except the target isn't right. Uh, so the target isn't right. It's all sheaves on bun G times x to the i. Uh, instead, I wanted this kind of tensor product of sheaves on bun G with uh, sheaves on x to the i, at least with some kind of local constancy. Uh, so uh, the um, how should I how should I say it? So let me let me maybe formulate first the um, uh, the kind of more serious theorem, uh, which is the uh, which is an, which is completely analogous to this, uh, which is about action, which is about not, not Betty, but this restricted one, which is the. So sorry, I think I intended to say a little bit more about the Betty case, but I think for lack of time, let me return, returning, returning to the case of interest. So the theorem is the same, essentially the same statement. Uh, local systems be check restricted uh, on M. Oops. Uh, that this is the same as as before, compatible. System of actions, uh, so it looks almost identical to and um, answer this thing that I've been calling Q lease. Uh, X tensor I. Uh, so this is a. Uh, and similarly, objects which are constructed are the same as uh, functors with check tensor on to uh, again just formally replace. Natural. A finite set. Okay, great. So this is the so this is the theorem about uh, restricted local systems. So this I should say is not uh, kind of a formal categorical statement. Uh, this is a this is a much more involved uh, assertion. But uh, certainly this Betty case was a was a large part of motivation for trying to prove this kind of statement. So this was a this was a statement hoped for, and with uh, with some effort, we were able to exactly prove uh, the statement. Uh, so okay, so that so now let's return to trying to get the um, this the so in point one. So so now we know what it means for for this uh, for this to act, and again, if we compare 
Uh, so, we, so we want to apply this to where M is, is the automorphic category. So she is on bungee. Uh, so, but the, it, looks, it looks great, except the target here is, is this least sheaves. There's a local constancy condition rather than all sheaves. And so you can ask, so, uh, so there's a theorem uh, essentially of Nadler and Yoon, uh, which says that if F is in, if F is a sheaf with no potent singular support in Bungie, uh, then um, H of FV. So if you apply any Hecke functor to it, then this lies uh, in this in the subcategory, which is uh, uh, sheaves. Nope. Bungie tensor, well, quasi least of X. So in fact, if you start with the sheaf with no potent singular support and you apply any Hecke functor, then, then well, the assertion is that on such a, on such a sheaf, um, Hecke functors, as you vary the point, act in a locally constant way. Um, and, so the, and, so the, and so a consequence of this, uh, uh, and so, well, just applying this theorem, this gives an action. What do they call? Access restricted feature on these sheaves with no potent singular support. Uh, so this is a, uh, um, so, so this is the way it's proved. So in some sense, this um, kind of spe this um, spectral action comes from just understanding purely the spectral side and how uh, it, it amounts to kind of this statement on the spectral side, plus this fact about local constancy of Hecke functors uh, for sheaves with no potent singular support. Uh, so this is, uh, this is where this, uh, this action comes from. Uh, so maybe I should comment that, uh, so a similar thing works in the, there's a version, uh, which I don't think I have time to talk about of, uh, in over complex numbers of Betty geometric lens of um, Nadler, Benzvi and Nadler. And this kind of argument, of course, also gives a, a spectral action in that setting of the, of, of, of this larger um, category on kind of analytic sheaves. So without uh, these, local uh, finiteness conditions. Um, and also, so theorem from our work is that uh, the converse is actually also true. So if, if F is a sheaf on bungee such that H of F V uh, lies in uh, well, let me say like this, sheaves on bungee, just for quasi least of X, uh, then, so this is for all, for all representations, uh, all B and left you check, uh, then F actually has no potent singular support. Uh, so in fact, this is this uh, it can, this can be upgraded to an if and only if statement. So that's a kind of a purely Langlands theoretic way of saying what no potent singular support means. It just means that the um, it precisely means that the action of Hecke functors is locally constant. Um, so so the, the theorem is stronger than Lomong's conjecture, I guess. Is that's that... right. Yes. So a special case of this, of course, is Lomong's conjecture that uh, Hecke eigensheaves have uh, no potent singular support because clearly Hecke eigensheaves by definition have this property. Hmm. Uh, this is, is there, is anybody going to uh, explain the proof of this theorem or maybe because both this and the 
previous theorem, the nadler yun theorem, uh -huh. are uh, crucial to understanding how this construction works. But are they are they? Uh, oh, uh, what what? Uh, uh, define what? anyone and going to. Right, right. Well, in this. In this, oh, uh, in this so, so, weekly, so yeah. So, so, so I'm not going to explain right. how this is proved today, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think Dennis is going to explain how this is proved uh, uh, next week. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's so, a local answer to your to your question. Right, there, so, I mean, there are other talks about these mm -hmm. kinds of things where I think this is going to be explained. Like I think Dennis is. Uh, in Dennis's seminar, uh, Dima is going to be talking about uh, this long paper, and I think he probably will explain. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, some of this. So Great. Maybe I'll give an advertisement for that. Um, but yeah, certainly there isn't time to uh, uh, explain that here now. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, all right, so that's, uh, I think that's what I wanted to say about, uh, about this first part of the theorem. So maybe let me try to briefly, uh, in the, in the large, in the one hour plus, in the plus, large plus epsilon, let me try to explain why, part of why I wanted to talk about, uh, the second part. Uh, what good is it? So. Uh, so this I should talk about kind of traces. So that's going to be the second large epsilon part of this talk, which is going to be about categorical traces. But maybe before I before I move on to that, any any other questions about uh, about this stuff? Well, I don't want to sidetrack you too much because I want uh -huh. to hear about the categorical traces, but I'll just sneak in one question. Um, okay. Uh, is there a factorization homology underlying this theorem? Oh, which 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 theorem? Uh, the one about restricted uh, locks restricted. Uh, um. So. Ah, um. I mean, yeah. I mean, yes and no. Mm. So, there's a. Maybe I should have mentioned that there's a that that um. So this so, I mean. There's a there's a there's a third statement which I didn't mention because it felt less relevant, mm. but let me mention it at least in words now, which is that here's how you can think about this theorem. So so, so part one is about describing this as a monoidal category. Right. Um, part two is describing this as an ordinary category. Right. Uh, you can ask for a description of it as a symmetric monoidal category, and that actually has the simplest possible answer. Mm -hmm. And as a symmetric monoidal category, it also has uh, this kind of universal property that functors out of it are the same as symmetric into A, another symmetric monoidal category are uh, functors where, again, where you replace this category by these quasi least sheaves. Uh -huh. uh, so, that's, so that's kind of the sense in which, that's the best sense I know in which this is a kind of a factorization homology. Uh, statement in that um, okay. it, it's a um, maybe may, maybe I should say the reason um, so factorization homology is much more general than about symmetric uh, than about symmetric things uh, mm -hmm. it's really about kind of EM things and this is this kind of consequences is a, is a consequence for purely uh, symmetric things. I see. Like, you know, like for instance, in the topological setting, we're working with surfaces, so it would be enough to consider a braided monoidal category. But this would, this kind of thing would not work uh, if you're, if the category that you were integrating was only a braided monoidal category. This is okay. something specific to the situation of it being symmetric monoidal. Maybe that's kind of a warning about the way factorization homology appears here. Mm. I see. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, all right. So, uh, so let me talk about kind of categorical traces, which, as well, is a kind of factorization homology. So, so the abstract setting. So, 
So maybe why, why do I even want to talk about it? Well, because, um, you know, from Langland's point of view, I mean, you know, we, we gave this kind of categorical formulation of some conjecture that's analogous to something, but maybe at the end of the day, you want to be able to say something about automorphic forms, at least uh, this kind of, uh, at least over um, finite fields. So the, maybe let me say this, the trace conjecture, which Dennis will talk about next week. Uh, maybe, now, maybe now the trace theorem should be called, but anyway, the thing that's called the trace conjecture in this paper, which is now a theorem, uh, is that if you take the categorical trace of Frobenius from G acting on this category, So this is exactly automorphic forms. So this 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 is the uh, uh, this is the assertion. So this this is the reason why I want to talk about uh, categorical traces is to be able to so that we can talk about things like this. And so this should be re should really be seen as a, like a uh, enhancement of the usual sheaf function correspondence. So I said in the beginning that if you have a Hecke eigen sheaf and you take trace of Frobenius, you get a function, which is an, which is an eigenfunction. Uh, this is kind of a souped up version of this, where by taking trace of Frobenius on, the, on this category, you get the entire vector space of automorphic forms. Um, all right, but uh, so the setup is like this, that if you have, say, uh, uh, let me call it C, maybe let me call it, but yeah, uh, maybe S, S is a good letter. S, some symmetric monoidal category. Um, and you have a, an object in S, which is dualizable. So let me remind you, this means that there exists something called X check and maps uh, from one S to X tensor X check called uh, maybe unit and from X tensor X check to one called evaluation uh, satisfying Zorro's lemma. Um, so there's some condition on if you tensor with X and you get the identity map. Uh, uh, this is diagrammatically what Zorro's lemma says and also the reason it's called Zorro's lemma. Uh, so uh, you have this kind of duality. Yeah, I mean, you could notice that I'm not careful about the order in which I write things. So everything, but this is because it's a symmetric monoidal category. And I'm not going to need anything more. Um, so then in this case, if f from x to x is an endomorphism, we can define the trace of f acting on x. Uh, so this is the composite map. I start with the unit. Uh, I apply this unit map, tensor X, then I apply F tensor the identity, and then I apply the evaluation map. So it's this composite. So this lives in endomorphisms uh, of, the, of the unit of the symmetric monoidal category. So this is what, uh, in the setting, this is what a trace of, um, of an endomorphism is. So let's, uh, of at least of a dualizable object. So let's let's give an example. So of course the first example is S is the category of vector spaces. Uh, then trace F V. First of all, this lives in endomorphisms, maybe a vector K or some ring K. Uh, so endomorphisms of the underlying ring is K, and this is the usual trace. That's what I try to teach my linear algebra students. Um, 
So that's uh, kind of where the uh, name comes from, if nothing else. Uh, so a more sophisticated example uh, is uh, where I take uh, S to be a kind of a Morita category. Morita. So the objects uh, are algebras and morphisms are bimodules. Uh, uh, so in this case, uh, so if I have A, an algebra, and M, a bimodule, bimodule, then trace of, I guess, M acting on A, well, this has a name. Uh, it's just the Hochschild homology, it turns out it's just the Hochschild homology of A with coefficients in M. So every so in this world, every algebra is dualizable. Uh, both the unit and the co-unit are the diagonal bimodule. Uh, and so then tracing through this definition, uh, you exactly recover the definition of Hochschild homology of A with coefficients in M. So you remember, so uh, let me just do um, another example of this, of this form. So, so one thing that, uh, so, so Hochschild homology, uh, you may know is a kind of a universal recipient for traces. So you can ask, how, are, how, how is this example related to this one? Right. Uh, I will address that in a moment. But before I do that, let me pass to a kind of a more geometric example. So where S is kind of the category of DG categories. Uh, and I take, and I take as my object, uh, You like to call it O, is quasi coherent sheaves on X. X is some, let's say, a stack. So, some ground ring. Uh, so, in this case, so, uh, and then uh, I have F from X to X is some endomorphism. Uh, and so I consider F upper star. From sheaves on X to sheaves on X. Uh, so you can ask what is trace in this case, trace of F upper star acting on quasi coherent sheaves on X. So this is kind of closer to the kind of question about trace of Frobenius uh, on these moduli spaces. So, first of all, we need to know that quasi coherent sheaves is dualizable. So the way it's dualizable, to exhibit it as dualizable, I need to produce for you a unit. Uh, and an evaluation map. So the unit, this is supposed to go. So the identity object here is vect. This is supposed to go from quasi co x tensor x. So a basic feature uh, here is that this is the same as sheaves on the product. Uh, and so this sends um, this sends the vector space to just the the diagonal. As before, uh, and, the, and and similarly, the evaluation is supposed to be a functor from X. So this, well, let me again identify this with uh, the product. So in favorable situations, when you have a kind of a sheaf theory, and you can identify the tensor product of the categories for the corresponding category and the tensor product, usually you have this kind of uh, duality that you can access geometrically. Uh, so I'm supposed to give a functor to vect, uh, and it's given by, uh, so the sheaf goes to, uh, well, gamma, everything is derived of x delta upper star. Uh, so, I so I again do the corresponding thing, which is I restrict to the diagonal and then I take global sections. Okay, so this is, so let's calculate uh, what such a thing is. And well, base change for quasi coherent shoes uh, tells us how to do this. So, so let's, uh, let me draw kind of a diagram, diagrammatically what, um, what trace is. Well, so first we're supposed to apply a unit. Uh, oh, sorry, if you can say quickly in this case. Yeah. 
Uh, what does Zoro's lemma say in this case? Is it easy? What, what do you need that is Zoro's lemma? Oh, uh, is it easy? Um, um, I mean, the, in, in this kind of situation, the way you, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it follows from this tensor product statement. I mean, it's just like, it's, it follows from base change in this case. It's, it's fairly formal, statement. you don't need anything. It, it's, yeah, it's completely, I mean, the, the, uh, if you have this kind of statement that quasi-coherent <laughs> sheaves on the product, the sheaves on the product are tensor product of sheaves, right. and you have, for the functors that you're dealing with, you have base change. I mean, it's saying that you start with, you start with X, mm -hmm. then you go to three, three copies of X, by yeah. pushing forward um, along the diagonal in one thing, then you restrict along the other diagonal, and you and you uh, and you take homology then in, in in one of the directions. Then you then you get back to where you started with. But now, if you draw this correspondence and you take the fiber product, you see that by base change, it's the same as pulling back along the identity and then pushing forward along the identity. No, I see. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I'm about to draw something similar. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's 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 compute this. So we start. So 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 what are we supposed to do? Uh, we start with we start with our point. We pull back to x. We take the push forward of the diagonal. Then we pull back along uh, f times the identity. Then we pull back along the diagonal. Uh, and then we push forward to uh, the point. Uh, so we so we start with sheaves here. Uh, we pull it back. We push forward. That's the unit. Then pull back along this functor is the um, is a f upper star tensor the identity on quasi coherent sheaves. And then we apply the evaluation map, which is you restrict along the diagonal, uh, and uh, you push forward. And now again we can apply base change to this. Uh, so this composite map is the graph of F, of course. Uh, so we're intersecting the graph of F with the diagonal. And so of course, what we get, so this is the fixed, fixed points. Uh, I should mention in order for base change to hold, uh, we have to do this, uh, even if you started with an ordinary, uh, with an ordinary scheme, you might end up with something derived. Uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise, base change won't work out. So you take the derived fixed points, and so the 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 what we get is that the trace of f upper star acting on quasi coherent sheaves on X. This is the same thing as functions on uh, global functions on the derived fixed point locus. Um, so, in particular, a good example. Uh, is if f is the identity, then trace of just quadrical x. This you get functions on. Well, what is the derived fixed point locus of the identity? Well, it's just the diagonal intersected with itself. And again, you have to do this in the derived way. Uh, and so this is the uh, this is the derived derived loop space, uh, which is uh, well, one can see is. For the same reason, it's also Huxley homology of this category. <coughs> Sorry, so the, the trace was supposed to be an endomorphism of the unit object, right? right. Is that, yeah. What's that? Uh, the trace was supposed to be an endomorphism of the unit object, right? Oh, well, in this case, the unit object is VEP. Right. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, very good. Uh, in, in uh, so this is as, so even in this case, when I was just looking at algebras and bimodules, mm -hmm. so this is as uh, endomorphisms of one, but this is, uh, well, the category of vector spaces. Right, ah, so. See. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, yeah, and this is also endomorphisms of the, so unit here is the category of vector spaces. Right. Uh, and functors, uh, functors mean co-limit preserving functors right. uh, that are that are linear, uh, and so this just like in the case of vector spaces, uh, the endomorphisms of the 
one dimensional vector space is canonically identified with, with K, with the ground <laughs> field. Similarly here, the endomorphisms of the unit is canonically identified with the category of vector spaces. Yeah, I see, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I should have. Uh... Um, um, so, okay, great. So now let me say this. So, uh, so let me, so, well, at least now this, this, this trace conjecture makes sense. It's in this world. So this is in this world of GG categories. So it's supposed to produce a vector space as I explained, but let me, um, uh, let me give a little bit more structure uh, to this. So in particular, I want to explain uh, how usual trace for vector spaces is related to this kind of Huxial homology trace. So the so the special feature here is that there's a, there's a, there's more functoriality. I mean, partly because well, this is a two category uh, rather than just a one category. So uh, so so we have the follow. So we have this kind of enhancement of trace functoriality. Maybe I'll call it functoriality of trace. Price. Uh, <clears throat> uh, suppose I have um, how should I say? It? Sorry. So actually, maybe before I before I do that, let me let me say something about the trace conjecture. The trace conjecture. Conjecture. So as I said, so is just purely a, a so we have that, what do you call? So it's restricted, you check, acts on, so we have, uh, we have this, that it acts on sheaves with no potent support on bungee. Uh, so so uh, trace is sufficiently functorial that we can take trace, so, so, so taking, so, and this is compatible with, uh, compatible with Frobenius action. Um, so I hope it's clear what this means. So local quasi coloc system has its own Frobenius. Uh, this Frobenius is not just an automorphism of the category, it's well, even a symmetric monoidal uh, automorphism, and it's compatible with the action in the sense that, uh, you know, it's a twisted module map. So that Frobenius on on here is a twisted module map for this action. I think that's a like one categorical level down. If you have an algebra with an automorphism and you have a module with an automorphism, for it to be compatible is that you know the automorphism of the module is a map of modules for where you have one action on the one side and the twisted action on the other side. So this is a, uh, this is the kind of uh, setting. So, so functoriality of trace. So this is kind of easy functoriality of trace, I should say, uh, gives an action. Of a kind of trace of Frobenius. Acting on quasi call restricted on trace of Frobenius uh, so this uh, uh, so the, so so the trace conjecture identifies this trace conjecture identifies this with the space of automorphic forms. Um, so in other words, um, yeah, maybe I should say something about the content of this conjecture. So in general, um, I said vector spaces, everything is derived. So what are derived automorphic forms? Uh, so, th so this trace in general, well, when I say vector space, it really means a complex. Well, here, what part of this conjecture means that it only has cohomology in degree zero. It, there's, no, uh, there's no other 
It only lives in one cohomological degree. That's in itself not evident from the definitions. Um, but anyway, so there's this algebra acting on the, so, so this is also a vector space, but because I started with a well, symmetric monoidal category, this is actually a commutative algebra. Uh, so what, what one gets just by taking traces is an action of, the, of this commutative algebra on the vector, and if you believe the trace conjecture, on, on this vector space of automorphic forms. So I should say this algebra here, uh, well, well, first, actually, let me, let me say what this is. This, uh, we already know how to compute because this is exactly the, this is exactly uh, this computation of, uh, this is functions on the fixed point locus. Uh, this is O of what we call Luxus, we check arithmetic. So check arithmetic, arithmetic by definition is the fixed point, is the well, derived fixed point locus uh, of the Frobenius um, acting on, on this thing. And so uh, maybe one thing to mention, so that's great, so functions, uh, so functions on this arithmetic uh, space of local systems, if you believe that trace conjecture then act on automorphic forms. Uh, but so, so one thing to say is that this, unlike uh, this restricted stack, uh, the stack of arithmetic local system is, is a true Arden stack. It's not for, uh, so it is derived, but it's not, it's not formal and it has finitely many connected components. Uh, so there's, so, taking Frobenius fixed points kind of kills all the, well, other than derivedness, all the kind of unusual features of uh, the stack. So, so, um, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, all right, so yeah. And so uh, the, the other thing is that uh, it's relatively easy to see that uh, there's, a, there's a map of algebras from Laforgue's algebra of excursion operators. So Vincent Laforg in his work uh, constructed a, an action of a certain algebra on the space of, well, in his case, um, well, together with um, Sung Shui's work on the, on the space of unramified automorphic forms. And so this action, uh, well, a posteriori, this action actually factors through this algebra. Uh, so there's a, there's a kind of an easy to describe map from this algebra of excursion operators uh, to, uh, to, to functions on this arithmetic stack of uh, stack of arithmetic local systems. Um, so that's, uh, this is why I was talking about this example. Okay, so any, any questions about uh, this thing? I think there's one more thing I wanted to say after this. And then, um, and then large epsilon will be complete. Sorry, when you take this trace of Frobenius, the uh -huh. answer the answer shows that it's a it's an algebra, that it's a ring. But yes. Did you, did you say there was some a priori way to see that this is a ring? I, I couldn't. Quite yeah. See. So the a priori way to see that this is a ring is that the, that you're taking that the category that you're uh, taking that you're acting on is a symmetric monoidal category, and this uh, this uh, functor is compatible with a symmetric monoidal structure, okay. uh, right. and something a little more. Mm -hmm. uh, that you need for functorial, but essentially, essentially, you should think that if I have a if I have a if I have an algebra of any kind and I take trace, then it should be the same kind of algebra. This is a this is a good heuristic. And okay. anyway, there are some technicalities for what needs to happen for this to be true, but mm -hmm. this is it's not hard to see that it's satisfied here. This is, so this anyway, this is by no means a deep statement. I see. Uh, I, I, I see. It's it's and, something kind of completely formal. Sure, I know. I, I can see that. Uh, and this uh, action of uh, this um, the ring of functions on the arithmetic local system. Uh, yeah. Did, this, uh, did you already say this is is this related to a Hecke action or something else? And... Oh yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so so this the action of this ring on this vector space. You're asking how did how is this related to the action of um, the Hecke algebra 
That's on right. the space of automorphic forms. Right. For, uh, and the and the answer is that that action factors through this ring. Ah, I see. Okay. I see. Uh, and so, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it's a kind of a refinement of Laforgue's, Vincent Laforgue's ring of excursion operators. Right. Um, so it's a slightly, uh, this is a kind of a slightly better factorization. Uh, although I should say, I don't know a very good description of this ring, but there's something even better that we can do. Um, can I make a uh, very naive comment? Sure, um, yeah. In the classical case, there's this uh, Eichler-Shimura relationship, which uh, relates the traces of Frobenius and the traces of uh, Hecke operators. Yeah, They're on the same cohomology of the modular curve. So it means yes. in, in this case, is there any way to take trace of uh, Hecke and uh, relate or try to see if the trace of Rubinus and trace of Hecke are related? Yes. Uh, this yes, is so, probably related to Min Young's question. Um, uh, I, yeah, I think so. So let me try to let me. Well, uh, well. So I mean, this categorical this categorical thing is is a well, this this categorical action you should think of as a kind of a refinement of the categorical Hecke action. So, you know, there the statement is that the categorical Hecke action factors through sheaves on quasi-coherent sheaves on restricted local systems. And, you know, upon taking trace, you get an analogous statement. But let me, let me try to, oh, let me try to address this, this question about taking traces of Hecke operators. Thank you. Uh, this was, uh, this is essentially what I wanted to say next. Um, was that there's a kind of an enhancement of trace. Uh, so enhancement of trace, uh, which is the following. So let me not give the most general thing, uh, but um, is, so, so suppose uh, A is an algebra. And M is a, well, here, the assumption is that it's a perfect A module. Uh, uh, and let me, let me take the, for the moment, let me take a, uh, well, and everything, everything equipped. Well, for the moment, let me take the automorphism to be the identity, just to simplify notation. Um, already, it's kind of an interesting statement. So then, then what do we have? Well, trace of M just by itself. Well, M is just a vector space, so that's a that's an element of K, uh, such as it is. Uh, but better, we have a kind of uh, an enhanced version of, but uh, uh, well, some number. Uh, so we have this enhanced version of, of uh, trace, uh, maybe let me call it class of M, well, trace. Enhanced of M, uh, we can upgrade this number to an element of the trace of A. So the trace of A is a vector space, uh, and we can upgrade the trace of M to an element of this vector space. Uh, so this is kind of something familiar. Uh, so it, literally in this context, this is what's called the turn character. So remember, trace of A is in this context, Hopschild homology. So this is the chunk character. Of M. Uh, and so one level up. Uh, so if A is a monoidal category. M a module category and a module category. Uh, we have uh, so oops 
So there's a condition analogous to being perfect, uh, which, well, uh, let me say with finiteness conditions. Mm -hmm. A kind of a trace of M, which is an object in the trace of A. So if, uh, uh, and the relate, so this is particularly nice. Uh, and the ordinary trace, and oh, sorry, trace enhanced, and trace of M, which is just a vector space, this is just a uh, comes from one from the unit object of the trace of A into trace enhanced. So you can, so, it's, so, it's, so it really is a refinement. So the kind of thing that uh, you should have in mind is that, well, uh, so anyway, so this is kind of a one categorical op refinement of the churn character, uh, but also, well, there's this statement where you can recover the usual trace. Uh, Sorry, and the same kind of thing is true if you decorate everything with an endomorphism compatibly. Uh, I was just doing this to save notation. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, and so, yeah, I guess I should say that in particular, if you take A to the M, what you see is that there's this category called trace of A. Uh, uh, and there's a, hmm. I've, I've run into a problem, which is that for a monoidal category, now I have two different things called trace of A. Uh, so let me, let me try to uh, say one is it's a vector space with an algebra structure, which is the Hochschild homology of this category. And the fact that it was a monoidal category that gives Hochschild homology uh, an algebra structure. Another thing is that I think of it as an algebra object in categories, and then I take its trace that gives me also, that gives me, um, you know, I think of this kind of Morita uh, theory of algebras of categories that gives me a category. So uh, this is a category. Uh, maybe let me call it, I don't know, whoops. Maybe let me, uh, let me call it maybe fancy HH to indicate, maybe that's even more confusing, I don't know, to indicate that, you know, I think of it as an algebra object and maybe I formally apply the bar complex or something that gives me another category. Um, and so if I take M to be A, it says that the, the, this, is, this is a category. Well, this has a canonical object in there called one. It might not be a monoidal category, but it's pointed. And the morphisms of this one is the previous version of trace of, is the algebra which is the algebra structure on the Hochschild homology of A just thought of as, a as an ordinary category. Uh, but of course, not every monoidal category is, is out modules for endomorphisms of its unit. Uh, and so that's the sense in which this, is, this gives a refinement. And similarly, for a, for a module category, the relationship is that you know, this usual trace is hom from one, and this has a canonical action of endomorphisms of one. And that recovers the previous non-enhanced action. Uh, did, I, did I lose everybody? I feel like that was all. It's good, thanks. Uh, so the, the point is, so let's apply it to, the, to, to our situation. So in our situation, uh, sort of this kind of HH of why is it called local systems? Restricted, if you check, this is just quasi coherent sheaves, unsurprisingly, on the stack of arithmetic local systems. Uh, that's, uh, that's again, just a general feature of, uh, it's, it's essentially the same calculation that we did for why just, uh, Hochschild homology of this category of the underlying category is, is the endomorphisms of the unit object here. And so enhanced trace of, uh, 
Huh? Um, of um, heaves milk of bungee, we get an object, so trace enhanced of this sheaves milk of bungee. This is an element. This is a quasi coherent sheave on arithmetic local systems. Uh, so this is a so this is an object we call drink. So this gives a sheaf on uh, so in this way this so if you believe that if you believe the trace conjecture which as Dennis will explain you should as it's a theorem then this gives a localization of the space of automorphic forms over this stack of arithmetic local systems so it's better than just a vector space with an algebra action. It's a quasi-coherent sheaf on a certain stack. And the relation to the original a space of automorphic forms is that this is the cohomology. Uh, uh, this is the cohomology of this, of this sheaf is uh, uh, that, that the, this identification is telling you that the, that, the, that the original trace without enhanced is, the, is home from one, which is just global sections. Uh, Is there a question? Um, all right, so now, um, so now let me try to, uh, uh, so, so this is what formal nonsense gives you, uh, is, is kind of this, this sheaf on arithmetic local systems, just from the action. Uh, if you believe the trace conjecture, then this says that um, it's global sections is the space of automorphic forms, uh, there's one other piece of abstract nonsense that I want to mention, which kind of relates this to more uh, familiar kind of things, which will exactly involve taking traces of HECA operators. So the so we have the push forward functor. From, um, from arithmetic local systems to just restricted local systems. So it's just, you know, you, you have a sheet, this is a, this is fixed points of something. You have a map of stacks, you just push forward. And now uh, let me remind you that uh, part, in part two of this theorem, we had a description of what an object here looks like. So in particular, we can take the push forward of drink uh, and uh, consider it as an object here. Uh, and the point is this now admits a, um, a relatively explicit description. So recall that an object like this, Chap is a collection of functors from rep G check tensor I into this quasi lease of X to the I. So uh, uh, so 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 for so this is very nice. If we have a, so, so what happens is this looks very similar to the kind of thing that we needed to describe the action. So you can ask, suppose, uh, so suppose they have an action uh, of Luxus restricted, quasi of Luxus restricted on some category given in, the ter in terms um, similar to how, Hekef, how we define the action on Sheaves and Bungi in terms of these Hekef functors, how do I compute the trace? Uh, oh, trace enhanced. Uh, I forget why. So, uh, so given uh, so let me just say so 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 given uh, an action of 
I get call says check. Oh, whoops, restricted. So suppose I have an action on some on some module category as functors. And let me put it back in Rabinius here. Uh, as, as, as functors, well, remember what such an action is. It's a compatible system of functors from rep G check tensor I to endomorphisms. Uh, let me call it H sub I uh, suggestively because in our case, M is sheaves with no potent singular support. And uh, these are given ex exactly by Heka functor. So and M tensor is quasi least x to the i. Um, so the so let's remember. So how does this work? So there's there's frog here. And there's frog here. Whoops, no, there's no frog here. And uh, there's a, I guess, no. There's a Frobenius here. So. Um, what is the corresponding element, uh, sort of trace enhanced? Uh, maybe let me give this, uh, I don't know, let me call it I lower star. So I lower star of trace enhanced of, uh, Corbinius acting on M. So this is, this is what you can ask. And the point is it has a pretty explicit description. So, so, so the answer is, well, what kind of thing are we supposed to describe? Well, we're supposed to describe a corresponding functor, a collection of functors, F G check tensor I, mapping into quasi lease of X to the I. Uh, the trace enhanced of each dot, maybe let me call it like this. And the, so, so the answer is that each dot, well, of, it looks like this. Uh, if I have, if I have some V, this is, this is just, uh, this is just the trace of H I of V composed with Frobenius. Uh, acting on my on my category M, so these kind of these kinds of things have a pretty explicit description. Sorry, that's what I saw. Uh, so the now I'm uh, now I've really extended my epsilon, but what I want to say is that well, well, so this is a so what will this look like? Uh, so in the so. Uh, sorry, I hope it's clear. So for instance, I'm supposed to give a vector space for every point of X to the I. So pick a point of X to the I, I get an endomorphism of M, uh, this one, uh, compose that with Frobenius and take the trace of that as acting on M. And that's, uh, so uh, what, what this is supposed to be, is this is supposed to evoke, which I think I've done a bad job uh, explaining is, but I think this is a, maybe think of this as a preview of what Dennis is going to talk about next time, uh, which is that in, in, the, in the case that, in the case that we're interested in, which is where M is uh, sheaves on Bungie with no potent singular support, uh, what we'll see is that there's a kind of a generalization of the, um, of the trace conjecture called the Stuka conjecture, which will identify this with homologies of Stukas. Uh, so maybe this is, hopefully that's not too far of a stretch that you're taking uh, your kind of, I mean, remember moduli spaces of Stukas are defined as the intersection of the, um, are, are, you know, of the Frobenius and the graph of identity on, on, on the Hecke stack. Uh, so, uh, well, as Dennis will explain that this, there's a refinement uh, of the of the trace conjecture, which is the Stuka conjecture, that this this is a uh, 
the cohomologies of Stukas. And maybe the last thing that I will say is that, well, this is kind of the push forward of trace enhanced. Uh, and in general, what's a, what's, what's a nice feature of the story is that, uh, you know, the way you can, uh, the way you can recover this category from this one is that, is that this category is exactly um, category of objects here together with equivariance for partial Frobeniuses. So you can make, you know, you can make sense of, well, it involves these x to the i, so there are partial Frobeniuses on this. And so you can imagine, uh, so compose this functor with Frobenius in one coordinate, and you are supposed to give an identification of those coherently. Uh, and such an identification is exactly the data of coming from arithmetic local systems. So it's exactly the structure that one has uh, more familiarly, more classically on, the, on these cohomologies of Stukas. Yeah, so uh, a nice question again. Um, yeah. Uh, in the Shituka case, you say you take trace, so it's this trace is actually a number. No, it's, this trace is a vector space. This trace itself is the well. This trace, as written, maybe you should think of it as a sheaf on x to the i. But uh, I'm not. But I mean, let's fix a point on x to the i. It's further mm -hmm. restrict. Then this is a vector space. Um, mm. Uh, the vector space is precisely some cohomology of this. Uh, which yeah, that's right. And the vector space will end up being so. Um, I mean, it's it, it is a. I mean, it is a. It is a very non-trivial statement here, that uh, this will end up being the cohomology of um, of some space uh, of, of some okay. of some sheaf on the moduli space of Stukas. Yeah, I mean, which sheaf you, uh, and which moduli space of Stukas? Well, that's the same parameters, the i and the v. Uh, it's of the corresponding sheaf by the Satakya. Um, similar thing. So the point is that. Uh, this gives a kind of a, I don't know, in some sense, this is the, the best possible answer of where automorphic forms live. It's that it's a quasi-coherent sheaf. Uh, it's a kind of a localization for automorphic forms. So, um, so one thing that Dennis will explain next time is um, if you assume the Langlands conjecture, then one can actually, uh, then one can actually say, which sheaf is it over here? So then, then uh, there becomes a purely spectral answer, conjecturally, contingent on this uh, geometric Langlands conjecture for the space of automorphic forms. Oh, great. Is that what you wanted to say tonight? That's what I wanted to say, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Anyways, uh, whoever is left, let's give uh, Nick a round of applause for a great talk. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that was a little more drawn out than uh, intended. Oh, no, no. no, it was great. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, wait, then... wait, wait, you're not finished yet. Um, what mm, about I... in the other direction? What about in the other direction? What about uh, ca another categorical level up? Is there uh, is there a, any uh, reason to yeah. think that this action is the last? This oh, I see. Thing. So I don't know. I mean, if you believe some story from some <laughs> some some story that's conjectural even to physics, uh, right? Uh, then there, then there's something. At, then in the, maybe in the Betty setting, I should say, then one expects that there's something, something more fundamental. Of which this action is the Some trace. Some higher version of which this is a further trace. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that. Anyway, I mean, even in the, even there, that's not, it's, 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 it's not at all clear that there should be anything like that here. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is what you're referring to the six dimensional super conformal? Yeah. Field? All right. right. I, well, yeah. Yes. I, all right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, it's conjectural even by physics standards. So. So, so what is it called? Six D super conformal field theory, or? 
Uh, yeah, it's uh, or um, the suspects behind it as they, yeah, uh, the yeah, the, yeah. The yeah, that's right, it's that one. Sorry, the uh, the, 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 the precise uh, supersymmetry classification escapes me at the moment. Uh, um, I mean, but what you're saying is that this process whereby Langlands correspondence comes from this repeated dimensional reduction and compactification in various directions from six dimensions translates into a statement about uh, high, higher and higher objects. Yeah, that's right. Although, I mean, there's something funny that happens there is that, well, this, this sort of, um, I don't know, you do, you do uh, it's not just dimensional reduction there. Which is also why it's tempting to, which is why it's probably unreasonable to expect anything like this in in number theory. It's also you know you start out with a field field theory that's not topological. You do dimensional reduction and then you look at different topological twists of it. That's right. Yeah. So it's I don't know. At least for me, it's very difficult to imagine that there's some some um, arithmetic analog of something like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, like topological field theories are much more universal in some sense. Right. That you expect them to show up anytime you can kind of reasonably talk about topology. Yeah. You can try to play the same kind of games. But, um, in this regard, the story that I know is you start off with a six dimensional uh, super conformal field theory with super uh, symmetry uh -huh. conformal zero. Yeah. And what you call, I mean, this dimensional reduction thing is essentially. Um, uh, one second, I'll start the video because it's not going to strain the connection. So this dimensional reduction thing is basically um, your six manifold, you think of it as a copy of uh, a Riemann surface uh, and punctures are important as well because you want uh, some meromorphic thing showing up there. These are called the boundary defects in the theory. And a four dimensional uh, manifold, which is usually just taken to be the Minkowski four space are uh, one. Huh? Thing. Yeah. And uh, so when you reduce the, I mean, it's basically you just uh, literally by hand your uh, six dimensional Lagrangian, you say four dimensions belong here, two dimensions belong to the Riemann surface. That's right. When you restrict it to the two dimensional Riemann surface, you end up getting uh, these uh, uh, HN equations. So uh -huh. you precisely, the, the gauge fields end up being Higgs bundles. Yeah. Um, so maybe, I can't say further than that how the, the it relates uh, over here. Well, let me make one comment about that. A few comments about that, mm -hmm. which is that one one uh, idea that one gets from the picture that you describe, uh, which is a uh, kind of maybe surprisingly missing from this whole from the usual kind of geometric Langlands story, is that it's a good idea to vary the curve. So there are lots of parameters. Uh, in this story. Well, you can't really vary G. It's a reductive group. There's no, nothing to do, but, uh, but the curve you can imagine varying and somehow you can try to get mileage out of, um, and that does not seem to feature very much in this kind of story. So, which is anyway, in some sense, it's a little bit surprising. So physics suggests that and from other considerations, one could think yeah. that that's a reasonably good idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so well, so let me say one thing is that one one can, you know, in characteristic zero, there are two other versions of uh, of geometric Langlands. There's the kind of the Durham version and the Betty version, um, and so there these these are compatible in the sense that both Durham version and the Betty version independently imply this restricted version. Uh, in the case of Durham version, one can actually go back that this restricted version. Uh, implies the Durham version, possibly the same is true for the Betty version, but one would need to establish more, more compatibility than has been done. Uh, but one, so this Betty version is the one most amenable to doing this kind of game where you deform the curve and doing something. So one kind of consequence of all of this is that, well, if you only, at least if you only cared about characteristic zero, say that you wanted to prove the Durham version, then it would suffice to, it would basically suffice to prove the Betty version. Because okay. you would prove the Betty version, that would do, that would imply the restricted version, and that would imply the Durham version. So this gives you a chance of uh, doing something by 
uh, you know, trying to kind of deform the curve to maybe, I mean, you know, the standard physics thing to do would be deform the curve to some kind of, a, to the boundary of moduli space. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and get uh, factorization results. Um, yeah, that's right. So, so, so at, I don't know. So now one one can hope to do that at least in that setting. Yeah, yeah. So as you said, the the Berry space itself just depends on the topology. Uh, that's right. But once you throw in a, a complex, uh, I, let me just stay in the complex world. If once you yeah. throw a structure on a curve, um, this variety does become a, a Kähler variety, so it gets a complex structure as well. And uh, you oh, can sorry, 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 sorry. Which one? Uh, the Betty moduli space. Oh well, it it uh, it has a complex structure right away. Already, so are yeah. you taking a are you taking a different? I mean, it's it becomes hyperkähler, is what you're exactly. saying. Sure. Yeah, yes. yeah, it becomes hyperkähler as but but if you change the complex uh, so it all so the complex structure on the Riemann surface also induces a complex structure in this space, and that's given as follows. If you look at the tangent space, it's basically um, H1 of the represent uh, of uh, pi one with values in uh, the representation at that point or the local uh -huh. system at that point. And um, the, the Hodge star uh, operator on the curve, which comes from the complex structure, does induce an uh, almost complex right. in this thing. So, 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 is this, uh, so, so, so are you realizing this as the module? So, but see, I mean, to talk about Langlands type things, it's not enough to have a complex structure. Yeah, you need an algebraic structure. So, mm -hmm. um, so from the point of view of algebraic geometry, um, this hyperkähler business gives you actually three distinct mm -hmm. um, algebraic structures. Mm -hmm. uh, only two complex structures, but three uh, algebraic structures. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So this is where in one you get the Higgs or the Hitchin system, in one you get the Betty, and the and the third one is this is uh, the, of Hitchin solutions or well the Durham. Uh, yeah. So sorry, you have the Ram is the Higgs, so that's the vector bundle thing. <laughs> Betty is the local system. Oh, sorry, no, you have. Uh, sorry, sorry. The Ram is the Ram local systems. You're Betty right. is Betty local systems. Yeah. So Bolt those are uh, and and yeah, and then there's uh, my apologies. Yeah. Uh, right. Yes. Uh, but anyway, I mean here. So like. So on, I mean, on the left-hand side, the you know at least in, like even in the Betty version of the conjecture, mm -hmm. the algebraic structure is significant because. Um, so this is very beautiful and important because in physics we have not been able to make sense of algebraic structure. Right. Nobody wants to, but nobody knows how to. So this fine little aspect of going from C to curves over Q is missing in physics. So I don't. This. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, so, sorry, I, sorry, I said that wrong, I think. Uh, the, it was not so important for the Betty version of Langlands, the algebraic structure is not so important because you take, important. I mean, you take this, yeah. No, I mean, you take this moduli space of G bundles such as it is, I mean, and all that matters is it as a, even a smooth stack. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, it's important to have a complex structure, but that's sufficient. Okay, good. Uh, That's very good. Okay, so so what I mean, once you start varying this complex structure, the thing that the physics thing that you build out of um, this structure is basically what is called the two-dimensional conformal field theory, and it gives you a vector bundle on the moduli space of curves. Yes. So uh, and the fiber of this bundle is basically uh, h zero of uh, a line bundle on uh, your moduli space. Sure. Yes. So, and then uh, there's a, a projective flat connection in this thing and everything. So I, I mean, that thing was always there from physics, but I, how does it, how is it at all useful in uh, geometric Langlands? So it appears, so, so there's nothing like this in this version of the story that I'm tell, saying. I mean, but it, it appears prominently in the, um, in the Durham version. I see. Uh, so, I mean, see in, um, The problem, the, how to say, yeah, I don't know. I mean, let me just say is that I don't, I don't see any, any kind of aladic analog of that. Uh, oh, sorry, am I, am I saying that right? Yeah, it was, see, it was significant there that Gosh, what to say? I mean, so your conformal field theory is this WZW. Uh, 
exactly. uh, model. Um, and the I, yeah, I mean, so the issue is this: is that this you have this identif you have this beautiful identification uh, with. Uh, Like it's about a, I guess it's about a, you know the line bundle is a is a, is just a line bundle on bunge it's a it's a like a holomorphic line bundle it's not anything with a flat connection or anything no. like that so a priori a I modularity don't know. of uh, local systems or uh, not the no, it's on no no it's on uh, so most naturally the line bundle is on the moduli space of G bundles yeah absolutely yeah it's not on it's not on local systems it's a I mean it's yeah, a holomorphic I line bundle on I agree. I agree yeah yeah yeah. I agree. Uh, anyway, there's some. I'm having trouble articulating what my objection is, but okay. there's some part of the game in 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 the setting that, um, you know, in one way that one one feature about the DRAM that makes it different from other kinds of features is that kind of a, a vector, it's like a sheaf with a connection, has an underlying sheaf to it. Yeah, uh, the... and that's and that's like. If you just have an elatic local system, there's no underlying anything. I see. Uh, and I don't know. That's that's a the your objection to this. So I can tell. I, I mean, that's that, 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 that somehow plays a significant role, at least in my mind, of the kind of thing that you're describing. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Nick. Um, I have to run in a second. So if I ah, could... okay, yeah. One last uh, naive question before leaving. Yeah, absolutely. This business about the six dimensional super conformal field theory. Do I understand correctly that what you are saying is that we, if our if our thing in op two dimensions comes from higher and higher dimensions, you get a higher and higher categorification. Is that essentially what you're? Yes, saying? that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's some picture that. Uh, uh, n dimensional field theory, quantum field theories have something to do with things like uh, n categories. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. And you know, the reason I say like is because you have to put adjectives sure. uh, in order to make precise statements. Right. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. And you're saying these traces will somehow then be enhanced to higher and higher traces in some way. Yeah, oh, yeah, well, yeah. Well, so, so, so first of all, trace from the physics point of view is just dimensional reduction. Right. When you uh, cross with a circle or something. Like when that. you cross with a circle. Yeah. Right. I mean, so when you cross with something else, it's, well, the factorization homology of X that I wrote, that's uh, the same kind of procedure. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, the way that this last part is related to what I talked about in the beginning is that there was a factorization homology with X. If X was a circle rather than a surface, then this would be uh, this ex exactly this trace enhanced. Right. I see. Or this, huh, uh, I yeah. See. Okay, yeah, that, that's how it helps greatly. Uh, so I don't know, maybe maybe let me advertise for you that you can think of this kind of, uh, I did this in two steps, but mm -hmm. ideologically you can think of it as w one step that you're kind of, that morally you're integrating over like the arithmetic curve, mm -hmm. by which I mean, you take the geometric, um, you take the geometric curve and you quotient by Frobenius. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and really this, this category of sheaves on the arithmetic, um, Local systems you should think of as this kind of factorization homology along this arithmetic curve of ref G check. Uh huh. I see. Yeah, that kind of simultaneously does both things. I see. So uh, local systems and the arithmetic curve should be thought of as factorization homology. That's what you said, right? Oh yeah, yeah. The, 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 well, either this moduli space or sheaves on it, or quasi coherent sheaves on it. Yeah. I see. Okay, great. Uh, I'll think about that a bit. But anyways, in the meanwhile, thanks. Thanks so much. This was a great. Sure. Talk. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> thanks. But, thanks for having uh, me. Okay. Whoever is left, if you still have uh, um, patience, you can carry on talking. I, I won't sign out of the, of the of the mm -hmm. meeting. So, uh, but I, I have to run myself. Okay. Thanks again. See you later. All right. Great. Yeah. I, no. one, okay. I, if you're not a super uh, excellent talk, by the way, I, re I was on the edge of my seat for the entire time. <laughs> uh, is, is the quantum group an example of G hat uh, G check S? Well, you need don't need a check, but G S. 
So yeah, the check is the check is you know because there's Langlands duality that you know that's convention which one is which. But yeah. uh, sorry, what do you mean by? Oh, you want to instead of rep G check, you want to put representations of a quantum group. Well, in, in so in the end, that's what it ends up being. But right now, so what I was just saying is, you looked at this uh, these uh, representations from pi one into G check S. S yeah. was the scheme, so it no, was no. Kind of deformation. Oh, oh, sorry, no. S is just is S. S you should think of as just a ring. It's just you have an algebraic group, and you evaluate it at a ring. Yeah. And it's just a group. I mean, what is a group scheme? Yeah. A group scheme you can think of in terms of functor of points, as for every ring I get a group. Mm -hmm. uh, so like GLN, the group scheme is when I when I when I give you a ring, I get GLN of R. Right. Okay. Okay. It's I, it's only the, it's it's this kind of thing. There is nothing. It's changing the base field of the ring, basically. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It's yeah. like like. Like when you have an algebraic group, it kind of remembers. I mean, you know, the way you should think about it, one way of thinking about an algebraic variety is um, it's like a, a bunch of solutions of polynomial equations, right? Naively, this is what you tell high school students. Uh, but then, you know, there's a, this kind of functor of points point of view tells you that it's like, well, that's exactly right, except you have to remember it, what the solutions are for all the different rings at once and how they fit together. I so agree. if you functorially remember the solutions, the solution set for every ring, then that is exactly the data uh, of the algebraic variety. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, it's just this kind of func functor point. That's what this functor of points point of view is doing. And anyway, no, but there's nothing like quantum group or anything like that. There's no. Okay. I was, yeah, just because the quantum group has a parameter as well, Q, and I was hoping one could say. No, that. no, that's, a, that's completely unrelated. No, I don't know. I mean, you can try to play some version of this game where you replace representations of G by representations of the quantum group, and I don't know. So I have very on that, but I, again, my first reaction to that was quantum group is really an algebra. So I don't even know what they mean by these representations. Well, no, that it comes, well, I don't know what I well I don't know in some sense I mean whatever quantum group is yeah. it gives you a it gives you a braided monoidal category that's absolutely true yeah this uh or so what, anyway but anyway whatever it is it's a it, a thing you get from it is a braided monoidal category so here I had rep G check as a symmetric monoidal category and you can try to instead play a similar game with a braided monoidal category so like there was nothing terribly specific about rep G check. I should say, but uh, but maybe the the downside is there was something specific in this story about it being a symmetric monoidal cat. I mean, I should say I don't know how to reasonably. Uh, anyway, it would be at least literally this kind of story you can't do for just a braided monoidal category. You need it to be symmetric. I mean, it's 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 these kinds of statements that are that rely on uh, here. It's these kinds of statements that really rely on uh, that really rely on it being uh, symmetric monoidal as opposed to just braided monoidal. Cool. Thanks. Um, it's uh, 